So thank you all for joining us today. It's a beautiful day in Gainesville, Florida. The sun's out, not that I would know it because I'm in the conference room looking at fluorescent lights, but I'm sure it's out somewhere. Uh, you know, the, the, the whole pandemic, COVID-19, has, has caused a, a surge, an excessive surge, in fact, in working from home. Uh, and that's and that's what we're talking about this today. Uh, businesses in the past that have given little consideration to working outside the office, let you know, letting let their employees stay home to work, um, are have had to do it in in very short notice, and 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 that's caused a number of problems. But most importantly, uh, today is is it's also opened up a lot of doors for cyber criminals and attackers to. Uh, to gain access into our systems. And that's what we hope to talk about today. Now, along with all the other changes from a cybersecurity perspective, we also have had a number of personal changes. Uh, you know, working from home brings a number of benefits. For example, a lot of people probably work in their pajamas. I will not admit whether I do or not, but a lot of people do. Um, haircuts. I've not had a haircut in two and a half months, and people that know me know that it's killing me. I, I'm wearing a mop on my head, and I've almost stopped shaving, and I'm not the only one. I see coworkers on video sessions that just don't shave. It actually reminds me of, a, of an old Batman episode, you know, the original series back from, what, 66 to 68, where, where one of the villains, the Joker or somebody, tainted cosmetics. Uh, Jan Janice is laughing. She remembers this when tainted cosmetics, so nobody was nobody was combing their hair, brushing the teeth, doing doing any of the any of the the, the personal grooming things for fear of, of contracting this 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 virus that the Joker or whoever it was uh, had had set out on 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 the on the on the country on the area. Anyhow, that just that, that just kind of popped in my head as as some of the unique things that's happening. Other thing of note, masks. We are all wearing masks. You know, right now it's not that big of a deal because, you know, you can't pretty much walk into any place. But I'm wondering how long are the masks going to be a thing? How long is that going to be the new norm? And and once once places like banks start opening up, how are they going to treat this? A year ago, if you walked into a bank wearing a mask, you were probably getting the cops called on you. Tomorrow, when you walk into the bank wearing a mask, what's going to happen? I imagine it's going to lead to, to, to some amusing uh, amusing circumstances. Anyhow, uh, to get back on track, enough of my musings. Uh, the purpose of today is to, frankly, help raise awareness. I'm a big believer in the best way to combat cyber criminals and protect an organization from cyber crime is through education of staff. because your, your staff members, your people are your best asset and your largest vulnerability. And I mean that in the best way possible. So uh, a, a, a phrase I'm very, I'm very fond of was coined by Sir Francis Bacon. And, and, and this, this was originally coined in, in Italian, and I'm not even going to try that, but it translates to knowledge itself is power. I, th I think that's I think that's a very a very strong and accurate statement. So we're hoping to 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 embolden everybody in this conversation with a little bit more knowledge. And the reason being, a, a, a another phrase, and I can't tell you who coined it originally, but another phrase that that that, that I kind of believe in is your body cannot go where your mind hasn't already been. Meaning that for most people, if they have not experienced something, if they have not lived something. If they've not made the deliberate act of investigating or researching or thinking about something in advance, then when an event happens, they're not prepared and, 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 and they fall into kind of a, an unintentional panic mode where, where they don't quite know what to do. So, so they inevitably freeze uh, and, and that, may, that may just be for a moment, but it happens. So, so I'm hoping that at the end of this, the uh, at the end of this next uh, 70 minutes or so, I'm hoping that everybody in this conversation will be a little bit more aware of some of the threats that that you may face, 
and some of the ways that that you can protect against those threats so that if things start happening that are undesirable you can respond quicker and hopefully in in, in a in a in a better way than what you might have originally okay that was a very long-winded intro and i apologize for that let's start off with a question just kind of lay, lay, lay the groundwork here um how many people before COVID 19 uh how many organizations allowed working from home on a regular basis okay that's the polling question the polling question is up now just a quick note you might need to exit full screen mode to view that polling question so if you're having that trouble go ahead i'll give you about 10 seconds to answer I'll give you a few more seconds there. Let's get our votes in. Okay, I'm gonna close the voting. And let's see our results. Okay, that's actually pretty good. Um, it's 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 actually what I expected. Most businesses don't have not historically offered uh, remote work from home. Um, so, so this this kind of mimics what what we would see historically. Now, the businesses today, most many businesses today, have been thrust into that, uh, and and many of them did it under a very abridged time frame, with frankly not enough planning put forth to it. Now, some businesses are the exception. I'll tell you, James Moore is a perfect exception to this rule. We have been offering work from home, remote workforce for years, which means when, when, when the orders were issued from the government to say, hey, don't go to work, either work from home or take, or, or take off, James Moore is ready to work from home. It wasn't a big lifestyle change for us. However, I have clients that historically have not offered work from home and literally weeks before COVID-19 really impacted the state of Florida, you know, in, in conversations, they were saying, hey, we don't need to work from home. We can't work from home. Our business model doesn't allow it. And literally three weeks later, they're asking me, Curtis, I need to be able to work from home. I have staff that, that they either work from home or I go out of business. So, so they, they, they had to, to come up with a way to make their business process work for them on a dime and that's and that's what we hope moving forward we can avoid happening for, for everybody else now i will say the topic of security is a very broad topic we can cover so many different bases so many different angles so many different subjects we can be in this conversation for the next 30 days every day but nobody would listen that long because it's also a lot like reading vcr instructions it's no fun for anybody so we're going to focus in this conversation on on three three aspects of security as it pertains to protecting your organization and specifically your people working from home we're going to look at data we're going to look at the general attack surface or attack vectors and we're going to talk about your people the hope is that these three areas will, will, will cover a pretty, a pretty broad base of what you need to know to better prepare yourself. So data, what do I mean by data? Lily information, any information that you have. This could be email data. This could be memorandums or policy documents. This could be your vacation calendars. This could be your financial records your payroll information, your bank account information, your vendor information. This could even be private health information, human resources information, such as employee evaluations, employee assessments, employee reprimands. Any, any of those, any of that information falls in the realm of data. Now, everybody, or at least most people in this conversation today, are municipalities. So I know what you're thinking. Hey, our data is free to the public. 
We have sunshine laws. We get public records requests. If somebody asks, we have to provide it. Well, not entirely. And everybody knows that. Uh, some information is protected. Yes, you. Yes, I, I, I can. I can go to any municipality in Florida and ask for a copy uh, of you know last week's memorandums that were posted. I can ask for a a, a listing of all emails that were sent that had COVID-19 in the body on the subject line. I cannot ask for the home addresses of the city employees, right? So, so there are limits. So as we're talking about data, we, 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 we want to protect the data from a couple different things. And we're going to talk about that in more detail here shortly. But we, we, we want to protect the data not, not only from prying eyes, but also from damage and manipulation. And we're going to talk about that in detail in just a minute. Attack services. We're going to talk about common attacks. And these are attacks that most of you, if you've ever sent in any of my, my, my security presentations in the past, you're going, to, you, you're going to hear what these attacks are. If you send in anybody's security presentation in the past, it's the same attacks. We'll talk about you know, the, 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 social, the social engineering attacks, the phishing and such. We're, we're going to go to those in a little more depth in just a few minutes. But we're going to go over the attack surface that, that your organization has and the vulnerabilities that are added from a mobile workforce. And then we're going to talk about your people. I said it already. Your people are your best, strongest asset that you have. They are also the biggest security risk that you have. Two sides of the same coin, and it's a coin that you have to have. Okay. So just out of curiosity's sake, do you feel that you are, are that your data is at more risk when you're working from home than in the office, or is at less risk? All right, here's another polling question. Go ahead, and uh, we'll leave about 10 seconds for you all to go ahead and answer. We have a few more seconds. All right, we'll go ahead and close out the question and let's see our results. Outstanding answers. You're absolutely right. Mm -hmm. In general, in today's age, working from home does put your company's data at more risk. And we'll go we'll into some details on that here in just a minute. So, so, so I'm glad that that's how most of the people answered. Now, I will say, when set up properly, when remote access and a mobile workforce is thought out, planned, and executed properly, the, the additional risk is, in fact, minimal. So, talking about data. There are a couple of different aspects when we want to talk about protecting data. The first and foremost is availability. Can I access my data? How can I access my data? How can I access my data safely without jeopardizing it? So remote, remote workers have a number of different ways to connect to your data. Uh, I'm going to throw out some, 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 some acronyms, acronyms and some terms. Hopefully, hopefully most of you have heard it before. VPN, virtual private network. A VPN is a great way to connect to your data because it makes a very special connection that's fully encrypted from your computer at home to your organization. A VPN makes it very difficult to steal that information in route. So we like VPNs. We like VPNs a lot. We're going to talk about VPNs in just a minute, though, because they're not perfect. Another solution uh, that is often seen, uh, remote desktop services, remote desktop protocol, some type of remote desktop solution like go to my PC. Uh, something that will let you connect your home computer to your office computer or office server where you see the office computer's screen, and you work as if you were on that computer. 
Now, I love these solutions from a security perspective and, and, and a data protection perspective because when properly done, the data never leaves your organization. You're working on your home computer. It can be it can be a fancy gaming PC from Alienware. No affiliation with James Moore. It, it could be an iPad. It could be your cell phone, in fact, your smartphone. We don't care because all the processing power, all the work is being done on the computer back at the office. So we love that solution when it's done right. Now, what I mean by when it's done right? Well, having that connection enabled through a VPN is fantastic. You pick up the best of both solutions. If you don't have a VPN, or if you do, you want to use something called multi-factor authentication. Multi-factor authentication is commonly referred to or described as something you know and something you have. A great example that everybody should be familiar with is your debit card. You, 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 you pull up to your bank's ATM machine, you slip, you slip your debit card in the machine, what's it do? It, it takes your card from you and it reads your card. That's something you have. Then it asks you for a PIN number, your, your special four digit code that hopefully only you know and hopefully is not written on your card. Something you know. Multi factor authentication helps protect the data. If somebody steals your ATM card but they don't have your PIN, the card's useless to them. If somebody gets your, gets your PIN but they don't have access to your card, or at least they can't scan your card, then the pin's no good to them. If they have both, well, then they then they have your money, they have your assets. But we do like those solutions because they do protect the data. They go a long way in protecting the data. And, and when you when you buddy up and you and you compound solutions, that does provide better protection. Other ways to access your data: cloud storage. A number of my clients keep their data in the cloud. Uh, and I'm not, I'm not really talking about Dropbox, although, although that is an option. You know, if you do the enterprise version of Dropbox, that has encryption and security. Uh, but I'm not, I'm not generally referring to that. Uh, I am referring to, to enterprise class solutions like Office 365, their SharePoint, their OneDrive. Not the personal stuff, but the business stuff that ties into your network. So you're using the same authentication mechanisms that you use in your network to access that data. And preferably, you're using multi-factor authentication. Other solutions, USB keys are storing your data locally. So of everything I listed, I kind of listed these in the order of preference in our opinion. As a rule, you never want to copy your data to a USB key and work off of it of a USB key for a number of reasons. Anything from the USB key can be stolen or lost. It can get corrupted. You end up with duplicate files, and we're going to talk about that in just a second. But it can also get stolen. Another option, copying files to your local computer, to your home computer. No, no. That's a, that, that's a big don't do it. Your home computer is a, a point of least protection. And we're going to talk about that in just a few minutes. Also, when you copy files to another computer and take it off site, at some point you have to have a mechanism, a controlled, managed, and reliable mechanism to bring those files back on premise and, and integrate them back with your other files. And what I've seen numerous times. Somebody takes files off site by copying it to a USB key or to a local computer. They edit the files. Somebody else has done the same thing with the same files. They both come back in the office. They upload their files and somebody's data is gone. Because the last person to upload the file wins. So if you made changes and your partner made changes. And you saved your stuff first. They save their stuff second. Your stuff is gone. So from everything I mentioned, USB keys, local storage, hey, don't want to use those. Those are bad. Now, another aspect of protecting the data, data integrity. 
data integrity is a big deal for me. Um, I truly believe, as, as an IT guy, my, my most important function is to protect my client's data above everything else. I have to protect your data. If I don't protect your data, then you cannot effectively do business. Now, protecting data, protecting the integrity of data isn't as easy as it sounds. What I'm protecting the data from is not just, hey, can I get to it? Is it there? But is it accurate? Is it available when I when, when you need it? And when we're talking about a mobile workforce, there are a number of things that can jeopardize the integrity of data. If if a virus gets in, it can corrupt data. Ransomware gets in, it can lock data. If your internet service drops while you're updating a file, a critical file, the data can be corrupted. That's a big one. That happens a lot. And that's tough. Um, another thing we have to watch out for, a less common threat, but just as important, is a scenario that, that a hacker gets into your network and not only steals the data, but starts manipulating the data. Now, I say that's not as common, and here's why. Typically, if somebody is getting in the network, breaking into the network to manipulate the data, they actually already have, most of the time, that person has access to the data and it's an internal threat. Frankly, it's a bad employee that wants to change something. An, ex an example of this, um, I can't show your hands, but a, a movie comes to mind, uh, War Games. Hopefully, hopefully some of you have seen it and hopefully I'm not dating myself. War Games, Matthew Broderick, Roderick, a, a young actor at the time, played the role of a teenager uh, that was very familiar with computers. And in this movie, he hacked into the school network and changed the grades of, his, uh, of himself and his girlfriend, Gable Mays. That's an example of jeopardizing data integrity. Data integrity is so hard to find. Data that's missing or corrupt, that's easy. Somebody clicks on it, it doesn't open. It's garbage. Hey, this file doesn't work. But files that's been changed maliciously, that's tough. Uh, uh, another theatrical example of data integrity problems, uh, action movie Die Hard 2, Bruce Willis. Janice is getting all these references. I hope, I hope other people are. Uh, Bruce Willis, New York cop, I think it is. Anyhow, uh, uh, militaristic force takes over an airport hijacks the, uh, the the signal coming in from the aircraft control tower and feeds the aircraft bad information causes the plane to crash. That's a great example, although sad, of data integrity going awry. Malicious, maliciously changing the data. Now, for the record, I'm pretty certain that that, for that to happen in real life would be almost impossible. I'm no expert. But it was a great movie, nevertheless, if you like action movies that way. But those are two great examples of data integrity. And I'll go on to say that, that municipalities, even though we have a responsibility to provide information upon request, we have just as much responsibility to provide accurate data upon request. Had, had a, a company years ago, probably... 10 years ago or so, uh, called me up because they had a problem. Somebody had hacked into their website and added content that was inappropriate. So when users hit the homepage, they were fine. When they drilled in to actually get information they were looking for, that they, they, they were presented with, with unsavory content. We, as, as business leaders, we as IT have a responsibility to make sure that when a user, a person needs to use the data, they can access the data and the data is accurate. And that leads right into privacy. Again, I, I've already mentioned a couple of times. We, we are municipalities, or you are municipalities. You have public records requests, but there's still information that we want to protect. 
cyber attackers are known for stealing files off computers and trying to use them in malicious ways, whether it's to steal somebody's identity, whether it's to forge information, whether it's to directly ransom the information for money. They want to take the data, they release it on the dark web, they release it to other organizations. It's, it, it's almost as bad as, as when, you, when you click on a link in Facebook and then you start getting all these pop-ups for, for things that you search for like shaving cream and razors. You didn't ask to search for those things, but you did a search at one point for Gillette. That information can be misused. So when we're working from home, we need to protect that, that information. We need to protect not only the, the accuracy of the information, but the information from prying eyes. So how does working at home affect all of these? First and foremost, availability. When you're working from home, you're connecting over the internet. You may have good internet, you may have poor internet. But I will tell you, I will guarantee, in the last six weeks, everybody that has worked from home has seen diminished service levels in the quality of their internet. Why is that? Most internets that come into the home are best effort internets. As more people have worked from home, the, the internet circuits have become saturated, things have slowed down, drop off some more frequent. There's only so much space on this, on this cyber pipe that we all use. So, so we've been seeing these types of random disconnects, random slowdowns, making availability tough, jeopardizing the integrity of the files. Users that are connected with, with, over a VPN and accessing a file directly from the server over the VPN, when they have one of these disconnects, or they get some line, the file can get corrupt. Privacy, privacy in the home is it works on a couple of different levels. First and foremost, who's in your home? Should be your family members, but you have visitors, uh, emergency repairmen coming over. Where, where is your home network set up at? Where, where, where's your home office set up at? A lot of people, since since this was a an impromptu thing, a last minute decision to hey work from home. A lot of people have their home office at the dining room table, in their living room, where their computer is exposed to anybody that walks by. Granted, nobody should be walking by besides family members, but it can happen. And we need to be aware of the cognizant of that. So, another question. Who here has been a victim of cybercrime? Uh, hijacking, identity theft, uh, spoofing, you, you know, so, so, somebody pretends to be you, any of that. Okay, the polling question is up. Go ahead and submit your answers, please. We'll give another five seconds or so and wrap it up. Okay. And here are the results. Very even split. Okay, that's good. Uh, I, I'm, I'm glad to see there wasn't more of that, but it's still, it's still quite a few people. The cybercrime, especially identity theft and hijacking, is such a common problem today. Um, it's 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 horrible, and it's only getting worse. the The only real way to protect from it is to be aware of what's going on, and and not not to click on things or or not to another thing, not not to answer questions. Uh, social engineering. Social engineering has been around since the dawn of time. Social engineering in the cyber world. Is, is simply just trying to convince you to do something that, that you may not ordinarily do. It, it's, it's often investigating. It's also often asking for information. Um, here's a great example. Uh, but a couple of days ago, my, my nephew got a call claiming, claiming the person was from the Social Security office and the, there was a problem and they were not going to be, he's not going to be getting paid or whatever. And they needed to identify, uh, verify his identity. 
So he gave them, whoever was on the phone, his social security number. With, with that information, his full name and social security number, that they can still have his identity, open up credit cards, open up bank accounts, buy a car and then not pay for it. And it all falls on my nephew. And, and he's, not, he's not the only one that happens to. That happens all the time. It, pe people prey on, on other people's goodwill and lack of knowing. The criminals are no exception. They, they know that people are working from home. They know the people are concerned. They also know that since people are working from home, they're probably feeling cooped up, lonely, a little bit isolated. So they're starving for additional conversation. Which, believe it or not, this scenario makes it easier. This, this, our current environment makes it easier for these criminals to to successfully attack their victims if you've been in my in any of my presentations before you, you've heard me say it um never never give away private information over the phone and private information includes your name i got called not too long ago lily a couple days ago they said hey is this curtis McAllister?" i, I left it with this is curtis can you verify your date of birth for me? We need to, we need to, we need to verify who you are. My, my response was simply, who are you and what is this about? The conversation went on a few minutes, but, but, but what we ended is, hey, I don't give away any other information. I've confirmed my first name is Curtis. Unless you give me something else, we're not going any further because I'm not going to give my date of birth. I'm not going to give my social security number. I'm not going to verify my address. I'm going to recommend that everybody on this call don't either. You have to be careful with even, even verifying your name. That's actually why I didn't say, yes, this is Curtis McAllister. I just said, this is Curtis. There, 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 there are attackers out there that are recording the call, and, and, and they're trying to pitch you something, trying to sell you something. They're trying to get you to do something, and, and, and they will say, is this Curtis McAllister? And they may gibber off something really fast, fairly low that you can't really make out. And when you say, yes, this is Curtis McAllister, they recorded that. And then, it, then it's been held up in court that when you say, yes, this is Curtis McAllister, the, their next statement that you couldn't actually make out was, do you agree to this? And since you said yes, you agreed to it. So I, I don't verify anything other than my first name. If they can't give me any more information, the call is over. No reputable company. Is going to call you up and try and verify information. The bank isn't going to do it. The IRS isn't going to do it. Social Security isn't going to do it. James Moore isn't going to do it. Same thing for emails. If you get an email asking to verify that information, it's not legitimate. If you get a text message called smishy, hey, verify your information. Don't do it. It's a scam. Especially the ones that say, Hey, something happened with your account. We're, we're asking all of our customers to verify their records. Please click the link below and log in here. Don't do it. Don't ever click a link or an attachment in an email, a text message, or a website that you are not explicitly expecting and asking for. If Curtis McAllister sends you an attachment, send, you know, sends you a Word document, and you've not had a conversation from, from me that says, hey, Bob, I'm, I'm going to send you this file. It's the latest agreement. I need you to look at it, sign it, ask, let me know if you have any questions. If you've not heard me tell you that over the phone, it's not legitimate. Treat, treat that as, as the golden rule in any of your dealings. I know it sounds paranoid, but I like to think of it, <coughs> excuse me. I like to think of it as healthy skepticism. Healthy skepticism will keep you safe. We've recently had a client, super, 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 uh, super great guy. Had a conversation with, was having a conversation on, on some personal deal. Um, attacker intercepted the emails, interjected himself in the emails, pretended to be his, 
my, uh, the client's other contact. The client ended up sending money away, transferring money. Found out after the fact that it wasn't legitimate. His, his original contact hadn't replied. Didn't even know the client replied because the thread was hijacked through social engineering, through, through phishing and spear phishing attacks. This just happened. And this happened to a client that has been that, that, that has been informed and trained on to look for these things. It's so easy today to to fool somebody and to trick you into doing something they want you to do. You have to keep a healthy level of skepticism. I also like to recommend avoiding Facebook polls, avoid Facebook server surveys or any social media surveys. Anything like I said earlier, anything that they asked you ask you to account to verify your account information is bogus. Other threats that that you will be exposed to: viruses and worms, ransomware, direct attackers, direct attackers being in the hackers. So when when you're at the office, you have advanced firewalls in place, most likely, that's scanning all traffic coming in and out, that's looking for signs of bad stuff. That's saying, hey, that doesn't look right and it's stopping it. Your computers are patched and updated and maintained. You have antivirus on them. You have other scanners on them. People is looking at those computers and taking care of them and, and doing everything they can to make sure nothing's getting in when you're in the office. Your computers are behind desks or locked in offices or behind closed doors. They're relatively safe. When you're at home, you have no advanced firewall. Regardless what what the, the the internet service provider told you about their modem that says hey it's got a firewall on it it doesn't it's it's firewall services are so rudimentary so so minimal all it really gives you is a false sense of security good firewalls the firewalls that you want to use have things like geolocation filtering hey I don't want anything from the Ukraine I don't want anything coming in from Russia. They have antivirus built in them, which is separate from your workstation. They have advanced heuristics and pattern matching. Home computers are often older, less well maintained. They may not have all the patches. They may or may not have antivirus. The Windows antivirus that comes on the computer, not bad. Better than nothing, but not the best either. Mac. Okay, you may say, hey, I have a Mac at home. Okay, Mac, Mac, Macs are great. They're not, they're not impervious either though, especially some of the attacks. Um, also, home computers often are shared computers, meaning you may be working on it during the day uh, for your office, but your kid may be playing games on it when you, you know, in the afternoon. Or you may be surfing Facebook in the, in the evening. Home computers in general are easier to attack for this reason. There's less controls. There's no active monitoring of these things. So I'll say, strong recommendation I want to make. Do not use the same computer to work at the office, to connect to the office that you use at home. I'll take it a step further. I mentioned VPNs earlier as being a great way as a lot of protection. Our recommended policy is only allow a VPN from corporate computers. Meaning, if James Moore didn't issue our staff member that laptop, that laptop does not connect to the network via VPN. Because a VPN, it, 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 it makes this great tunnel, which is completely encrypted, like it's like a lead, lead tunnel that even Superman can't look inside of. But once that tunnel is made, there's a threat on the home computer. It has direct access right through the firewall into the corporate network. Here, here's an example. 2018, uh, it was reported, it was discovered that there was a group of Iranian hackers, not picking on, on, on Iran, it just, it's who they were. Uh, they successfully successfully attacked 300 universities worldwide, like 127 of them here in the United States. 
47 private companies. They stole, for nefarious purposes, 31 terabytes of data. That amounted to $3 billion of intellectual property. They had, when they, when they were discovered, they had 8,000 user accounts. They, they, these are just the maybes. These are the confirmed user accounts that they were able to steal. What if your account was one of those 8,000? So, in general, quick question. When you're working from home, who, lock, who here locks their doors even when they're working from home? My polling question is up. As a reminder, you may need to exit full screen mode to view the polling question. So the slide itself isn't what you need to answer. You should be looking for a blue window with the question there. We'll give about 10 seconds for everyone to finish answering. Okay, we're gonna close that question and let's take a look at the results. Outstanding. Love to see that. It's a trick question though. Uh, it, was actually, it was actually intended to, 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 to raise light. Uh, when you're working from home, you, you, you need to lock your cyber doors. Although I will say, I like my doors as well. Uh, it's, it, it's good practice. 30 years ago, that wasn't necessary, but today I think it is. A um, couple examples. NASA, I'm gonna pick on NASA for a minute. And I'm gonna pick on them because I tell you, I have great respect for NASA. NASA has some of the brightest minds on the planet. They've done great things. And I believe everybody, I think everybody would agree, I hope, maybe this should be a poll question. I think everybody would agree that NASA probably has some of the best security that you'll ever find. That being said, 1999, NASA was hacked by a 15 year old kid. He, he, he hacked into a remote router, a remote network in, in Dulles, Virginia. He was able to install a backdoor onto the network, which gave him access to user accounts and information, and he was able to steal data. Twenty eighteen, NASA was hacked again. Big public network. This hack made it deep into the NASA network. They made it into the Deep Space Network's array of radio telescopes made it into JPL systems. This one, this one sucked because I think this was an IT guy's fault. This one, NASA had set up a, a separate network, what was, supposed to, what was supposed to be a separate network for vendors to access information. Vendors could remote in, gather information on proposals, what have you, right? Somebody stuck in a small, cheap, little computer module that you can get for like 25 bucks off Amazon on this network, didn't document it properly. A hacker found that device, hacked that device, compromised the rest of the network. The big deal of both of these instances is, are, are they were successful, first and foremost, but the attacker didn't come in through the front door. The attacker didn't attack NASA directly. The attacker attacked remote locations, ancillary locations, secondary locations. See, see the movie Hackers? Love the movie Hackers. It's a geek movie. See the movie Hackers? When, when, when they hacked the Gibson, they, they didn't come in the front door. They went through back subroutines. That, you know, they, 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 they went to the garbage files where, where, where security was weaker. My point to this is you have to treat the entire network as a security vulnerability or as a footprint. When you have people connected from the outside, from their home computers, especially over a VPN, that's an extension of your corporate network. Therefore, if there's a virus on a home computer and they connect to your corporate network, then your corporate network is vulnerable. Love VPNs but only when they're connected from corporate computers. Any non-corporate computer, 
the way, the way we recommend we recommend it be done. If a user needs to connect from a non-corporate computer, they use a remote desktop solution. Something that requires them to log in with two multi-factor or two-factor authentication, and they log into a desktop at the corporation. They do all the work over that medium. Therefore, corporate data never leaves the organization. Also, any data on the local computer, any viruses and such, don't get passed through. Now, there are still key loggers. There's still a number of things that can, you know, they can still be used to pilot the network, but that does propose, pro, uh, propose the least amount of risk to the organization. So, five straightforward, easy ways to, re, to, to help protect your corporate network. And this is by extension, working on your home computer. The computer you're using to make that connection with, however that, however that connection is being made, whether it's a VPN, whether it's a remote desktop solution. First and foremost, do not do any social media, online shopping, anything. Don't play games on it, none of that. Keep it dedicated just for work. When this is over and you don't want to use it for work, then go back to playing on Facebook and, and playing your games on it in your chat rooms. But while we're in this state, we'll, we'll, where we are working from home, dedicate it to just that, just work. Pop-ups, any computer that you're on ever, work or our, our, our home computer. If you get a random pop-up saying you must update this, you almost never have to update it. It's often a scam to install malicious software. If you, if you get a pop-up, Close it or contact your IT and ask them. But do not click on pop-ups. said it earlier, don't click on links, don't click on attachments and emails. Don't let other people play on the computer. I know it's your home computer. I know your son needs it to, 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 to play games with his friend or daughter, whichever. While you're using that computer for work for the duration of COVID-19, don't let them on it. Hey, listen, love you. But this is this is a computer that I have to use for work. So unfortunately, for the next several weeks, you gotta play on your phone. Or read a book. Novel idea. That's those paper things we used to have. Don't click links. I've, I've already counted that in, in enough. Don't leave your system unattended. What I mean by that, however you're connected, VPN, remote desktop, cloud services, it doesn't matter. When you're going to lunch, when you're done for the day. When you do when you when you're not gonna work, shut the computer off. Disconnect. If you just if you're just gonna take a take a break, at a minimum, lock the computer. Hold on the Windows key and the L will lock the computer so nobody can walk in and grab it. Because here's why. If an attacker is in that computer and can see what you're doing, you lock the computer and walk away and you come back and it's unlocked, you need to call IT because something's happening. But don't, leave, but don't leave it unattended. Don't leave it connected to the corporate network under any circumstances. So some recommendations that, that I always make because frankly, they just work. Use unique passwords. What I mean by that? Do not use the same username and password across all the sites, your Facebook, your bank, your credit card, your corporate logon. I, I, I love my father to death. I recently had help him with his computer. And I discovered, beside, you know, regardless of all the preaching I've ever given him about this, I, I recently discovered that he has the same password on everything. Or at least he had the same password on everything a few days ago. Don't do that. Hackers know that human nature is to keep it simple. So they will use the same password or a variation of the same password on everything. If a hacker can break into your Facebook account, he knows the password or some derivative or variation thereof will probably get them into your corporate. So don't do that. Use unique passwords. I like phrases. Something that's, that's 16, 18, 36 characters long if you're allowed to. We the people is a great one. To boldly go where no one has gone before. Great one. Yippee KIA. Great one. Don't use any of those. Because they're great ones and everybody knows they're great ones. But use a passphrase that you will remember easily, but it's hard for somebody to guess.
<coughs> don't write the password down anywhere. I hear what you're saying. I hear you. Curtis, you want me to have unique passwords for the 57 different sites I have to log into, but I can't write them down. And I can't make them the same. What do I do? You're killing me here. Here's what you do. Passphrases are easy to remember. Or you use something like a password log, an encrypted password manager. I think the firm here, James Will uses LastPass, for example. No affiliation, we're not a reseller, but that is something that we use. LastPass is a great tool for this sort of thing. You store all your passwords in this, you have one encrypted password to remember, it takes care of the rest. Always, if it's an option, always choose two-factor or multi-factor authentication. It helps, it works. Banks always offer that. Organizations, more and more organizations are letting you use that. Remember, multi-factor, something you know, something you have. I have my debit card, I have my debit card, I know my PIN number. In the case with banks, often it's I know I know my username and my passphrase, and I have them send me a text message to my cell phone. Yes, your cell phone can be stolen. Hopefully, your cell phone has a password on it, as encrypted. But I'm going to get into that in this conversation. But as a hint, hopefully, your cell phone has a password on it and is encrypted. Don't respond to account verifications. Don't respond to unsolicited emails of any type. Don't respond to the random email from, from your daughter that says grandkids. Hopefully, your daughter has called you, said, hey, the kids and I went to the park. I got some great pictures I'm going to send you. Okay, in that case, you can probably open it. But if it just shows up out of the blue, don't open it until you call. Hey, daughter, did you send me some pictures? Oh, you did? Great. No, you didn't send me pictures? Okay. Just don't do it. Keep a healthy level of skepticism at all times. There's nothing wrong with that. Now, last thing I want to talk about are your people. I've said it, I've said it several times. Your people are your strongest asset and your biggest security hole. The problem with working from home is people are feeling isolated. They're getting cabin fever. Fever. Uh, they're 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 struggling for social interaction. Help them with this. You yourself can encourage this and you need to do it yourself. First off, enjoy the little things. My home setup is actually outside of, in, in my shop, in my workshop. I look out my big baby workshop door. So when the wind's blowing, I can see the I, 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 can, see, I can see the leaves rustle and the trees sway. I have pet ducks. My ducks come and visit me. I get to enjoy that for a few minutes. Uh, several, several times a day. It helps keep my mood better. Helps keep me from feeling isolated. I stay in communication with people. Constant communication. When you're working from home, more communication is better. And not just more communication. Make it valuable communication. Instead of picking up the phone, use video streaming technologies like Skype for Business or Microsoft Teams or Go to Meeting or something. Have that face-to-face -face conversation. Enjoy a little bit of banter, even. You don't have to keep everything so so strictly to business. It's okay. To, hey, it's you know it, it's, it's great to see you, Bob. How's your kids doing? Fine. Have that little bit of conversation, just like you would if you were if you were at the coffee pot. It doesn't have to be long and elongated, but just enough to keep that social interaction happening. That helps keep you from feeling cooped up and stressed. It's been proven that, that when you're feeling cooped up, your stress levels rise, you start making bad decisions like clicking on emails that you shouldn't click on and talking to random people that call you. So nurture those relationships while you can, as you can. And if you have to, follow up intentionally. Just, hey, I just want to check on you. How are you doing today? Always good practice. And once in a while, being at home, also gives you the benefit of being able to focus because you don't have people knocking on your door all hours of the day. So you can put your head down and you can really power through. Remember to pause for a second every now and then. Take a breath. Smell the roses, so to speak. If you're cooped up in, 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 
in, in a closed closet all day doing your work, look out the window. Get some fresh air. Help, just take a second and help refocus yourself. Get your mood right. And then get back to work and knuckle down and, and, and pound through some more work for a little while. That's okay. So, we've gone through a lot. I've tossed a lot your way. After all this, let me ask you again. Do you feel your data is more safe or less safe when you're working at home? Okay, you see that quick poll window up there? Go ahead and answer the polling question. This is our last polling question, obviously. We'll give you about 15 seconds or so. About five more seconds. All right, let's see what everyone has to say. Beautiful. <laughs> so, kind of sum it all up in brief. Lock your doors, not just your home doors, but lock your cyber doors. Make sure you're using those security protocols. Make sure you're protecting your digital footprint. Keep, keep your eyes and your ears open for those malicious emails, those malicious phone calls, those malicious text messages that don't belong. They're not gonna, they're not gonna jump out at you and say, hey, I'm a bad message that will steal your information. So you, so you kind of have to be aware that they're out there and just pay attention to them. Again, healthy skepticism. A smidge of paranoia dashed in is okay. Most of all, stay safe, both from the current COVID-19 threat and from the digital cyber threats that we're faced with every single day. Stay safe. Are there any questions? There are. Uh, let me go ahead and get to them over here. We had a few come in. For example, uh, one was, does connecting a screen to a non-work laptop open up the same dangers? As in using the setting that lets you extend your screen to have two monitors. No, that's totally fine. Okay. Uh, another one we've got, my company has a firewall. Does that protect me when I'm connected from home? Not typically. There's a number of settings that play into that. Uh, so, so there can be some protections in place, but I would go into the assumption that it does not protect you. And take that step further, you can get infected when you're off network and then you connect to the company network, which means the firewall wouldn't do you any good even if, even if the settings are configured properly. So always assume the corporate firewall is going to do nothing for you. All right, and one more question regarding passwords. What if passwords or passphrases are similar but with minor variations? For example, go to the store 88, then go to the store 95. That's 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 better than password one two three. <laughs> um, I, I I would change it up a little bit more. For example, under those scenarios, I I, I would capitalize go or store along along with the number change um, i definitely would not do, just do a two character change i on a password that long i would have at least six different characters changed in that and it could be special characters it could be spaces capitalization um and i'll say that there's no hard and fast rule about that but the criminals know that that that's the that that's the trend that we use now that's a long enough one that would we'll probably never be hacked either way but I would still not risk just, just those two characters. Okay, all right, thank you, Curtis. And uh, here, thanks for your time today. You've given us a lot to think about. Now, I'm assuming uh, many of you might have more questions or may you think of some later regarding your work at home setup. So we encourage you to contact Curtis and his team with any questions or concerns. They're more than happy to uh, help you with that. Now, one more thing here. I'm going to go ahead and paste the URL for your, hang on one second here. I'm going to paste the URL for the CPE, the credit evaluation link, and that is coming through now. So go ahead and complete the evaluation to, uh, to obtain your CPE credit, and the link will also be emailed to you. So if you miss it here, can't find the chat window, it will be coming anyway. And if you did submit a question through the webinar that we didn't catch, we'll follow up with you in the coming days individually. So thank you once again for attending our webinar and um, have a great day.